All right. So let me take a couple of minutes to just uh, wrap up what we were discussing in the previous lecture, which was this overview of the uh, essentially the heart model and the pacemaker timed automaton that you have to work for your next worksheet. So we'd already looked at the, um, the uh, automaton of the, uh, the SA node or even the ventricle. They are identical as was discussed even in the lectures. Uh, the only difference was how we had implemented that transition system or the automaton with the messages and the clocks and the resets looked a little bit different from what we had been uh, uh, sort of studying in, in PowerPoint. But, but I hope you were convinced that even though the implementation was different, uh, the, the functionality is exactly the same. And so let me first quickly give you an overview of the, the, the path automaton. So this is the one shown on the right. So it accepts, you know, activation of the paths from the from the atria and the ventricle, and it generates a signal for the activation of the nodes. So if we go inside the uh, the state flow of uh, of this automaton, it looks something like this, right? So we uh, this is very consistent with even the the view that we had in the uh, in the slides, and so you are you are basically in the idle state, which is your initial state. Uh, when both the atria and the ventricles are in rest. And look, the only way out of this idle in the direction of anti-grade conduction is when uh, node one issues this message of activate path one equals true, which means that essentially the atria has depolarized. So as is consistent with our uh, understanding, when that happens, we reset the conduction clock to some definition of the delay. So in anti-grade, the difference which is similar to how the node is set up is that there is a self-loop which says that um, if your conduction delay is positive and you haven't received any simultaneous propagation from the ventricles, keep counting down your conduction delay, right? So this is the conduction delay equals delay minus one. And so this is the self-loop and the only sort of transition or two transitions out of anti-grade are one is when you actually exhaust your clock. So if your uh, retrograde signal is false and your conduction delay is equal to zero, then you activate the ventricles by issuing this node two. And remember how in the PowerPoint or in the lectures, we were calling this state wait. It is exactly the same. Just the name of the state uh, in this implementation is, uh, is conflict. Uh, I guess the uh, idea being that it resolves this uh, infinite, uh, the conflict of the infinite loop. That's why. Uh, we called it conflict, but it's behaving the same way, right? So, so when we go to this conflict, we are setting this uptime equal to zero. Within conflict, we only remain in conflict until uptime equals one or positive. And as soon as that happens, we take the transition back to idle. So we will remain in this waiting state uh, for just one time step, during which we have sent the anti-grade propagation signal to the ventricles. Uh, and so very similarly, the mirror image is going to work out for the retrograde and also consistent with our understanding is this double state, uh, which is invoked if you are in anti-grade and you receive uh, while the conduction clock was still not expired, you received uh, a signal uh, which was act path equals true. So this is what you receive. And so you go to the double for again one time step before going back to idle. Okay, so I, I went over it a little bit quick because it's very consistent with uh, with what we have already been paying attention to. Something that I do want to uh, tell you before we actually jump into the lecture is uh, what's a good way to you know debug your your model. So let's say we go to our uh, SA node and you know this has been initialized to some rest period and ERP period. So inside this SA node we have our now familiar. Uh, st uh, transition system or an automaton. So one very useful thing to do is, you know, you can enable uh, in, uh, when you when you debug in Simulink or, or in state flow, you can enable some breakpoints, almost like you are, you know, want to step down in your code. So when I did that, it's maybe a little bit difficult to see, but this this notation of this red dot was added on the transition. This is equivalent of putting a breakpoint in my system. Why is that useful? So this might take a while because you know this uh, machine is a little bit slow. But when I run this, and hopefully it will run in a uh, few seconds, we can wait for that. But what debugging will allow you to do is that instead of 
just running the entire model from zero till 10 seconds, it will simulate every different time step individually until you, know, you reach the breakpoint in this condition. So let's wait for, for that to happen. It's compiling the, the model. And you'll see in just a second that time will start to propagate and it will be shown in our, uh, in our view of this uh, automaton. So let's just give it some, some time. Okay, it's initializing, and so now you can see it's simulating the timer. So if you look at the bottom right, this is how time is progressing in the system. And as is also consistent with our knowledge, the first thing which was likely to happen is that the SA node will try to transition. So we reached time equal to 1001. So let me show you what is happening, right? So if you, another useful thing in state flow is if you just hover your cursor over any variable, it will show you the current value of that variable. So you can see that the current rest period is zero, and the definition of the rest period was 1,000, or one second. And so what was happening is, when we simulated the system, it consumed 1,000 clock cycles, and now when time is equal to 1,001, this transition is enabled. But it was not taken because I set a breakpoint here. Now what can I, and also consistent with our view of the heart is that the path automaton is still in idle because it hasn't received the uh, activate path signal true yet, right? So we can confirm that um, what is the value of act path? It's actually zero right now because we still have to set it high for one duration like we discussed in the previous um, um, lecture. So how you can use this debugging ability is that instead of you know uh, regular um, uh, simulation, you can actually step through. So we will just step to the next time step. Instead of running play, I just hit the next step. And now this transition has been completed. Now you actually arrived at the temp state. So when you do that, when you arrive at the temp state, because of this transition, we are setting our activate path equal to true here. right? And we are also setting the ERP timer to be the default ERP period. So, so act path should be Let's see whether it's, it is true yet or not, or maybe we have to step through uh, one more time. Act path is one. And so what, what, we, what we should see is that when we get out of this ERP or when we progress time again, we should go from idle to anti-grade in our path automaton, which you see just the transition was taken. Right, so this is, we were doing this mental exercise, but now you can actually visualize how Simulink does it. And so you know you can put breakpoints of interest based on the homework exercise that you want to emulate, and even convince yourself that indeed you know what I'm emulating is is happening. And so if you, if I continue next, we will probably go into ERP. So we the ERP becomes the active state, and we remain in anti-grade for whatever conduction delay uh, you have set. All right. So is it clear how you can you know in, interact with this Simulink model? Because you'll have to do this many many times. Uh, possibly for each step of your, uh, of your homework. Uh, we can also do more debugging. So while the simulation is still paused, um, I can maybe go out to some upper level and let's look at what the scope um, is showing us. If again, it, it cooperates and opens up. Okay, it's still, okay. Uh, oops. Yeah, this computer is still slow. I think the scope is still not updated because of the, the delay in the simulation. But there's another way we can convince ourselves that things are consistent with our knowledge. If we look at the ventricle, so while, while we are in anti-grade, what should the ventricle be doing? It should still be resting, right? Because the, the delay from the conduction from the anti-grade hasn't reached the ventricle. So let's convince ourselves that is indeed the case, right? So the ventricles are still at rest. 
and you can go back and see that the atria is an ERP and the path is an integrate conduction. And you can do step by step, you can set up other interesting breakpoints. Uh, so one another, I think, capability is that you can also set a breakpoint when you enter a state and when you exit a state. And that's also allowed, not just transitions. Okay, so this was mostly like a warm introduction to what this uh, Simulink model does, uh, which is what you have to use uh, for your worksheet five. So I hope this is clear. Uh, if you have any troubles running any of these algorithms, uh, Piazza is your friend, and that's the best way to, to debug so that others can also learn. Any questions on how to set it up? So if you haven't started yet, I would really recommend you give it a shot, because don't wait for the 11th hour. This worksheet is time consuming, OK? OK, so, so just like in the previous module, we spent time understanding the domain. Then we almost had a couple of lectures which had nothing to do with buildings, and it was more of a, you know, the theory or the principle of uh, parameter estimation and, and uh, least square regression and all these methods. We will have something very similar in flavor uh, in this module as well, right? So the next two or maybe two and a half, three lectures are going to be decoupled from what we have studied about the heart. We want to now actually start understanding this idea of model checking, and you'll appreciate why we spent all this time trying to uh, build a timed automata uh, of the heart because of this principle of model checking that we want to utilize for. Right, so I'm probably going to use um, yeah. So so I've said this before that to do model checking, you require two things. And I showed you some pictures and examples. The first thing is that we require a mathematical model that we want to do model checking on. And the second thing that we require is some sort of a specification, or you know, what, what property do you want the model to satisfy, or what do you want to explore that this property is never violated. And uh, remember how we had this uh, idea of that model checking is powerful because if your model checker, which is a tool that you will use, if it outputs that this property is never violated, then it means that for infinite possibilities in your model, it is never violated. Because if even there is a single violation of any given property, then the model checker will return that as a counterexample. Right? So it is exhaustive. There's this notion of over infinite behavior of your model, we are trying to make claims and guarantees, which is the contrast from testing, where you know you are only doing finite amount of testing, and there is no guarantee that in the millionth and one test, the thing will fail and not work according to your uh, sort of uh, expectation. So we need two things for this machinery to work. One is uh, a mathematical model, and the other is the specification. So no surprises that our mathematical, mo mathematical model is this timed automaton. And the specification we will specify using a language, formal language that I will teach you called linear temporal logic. It's a mathematical precise way to describe requirements so that there is no ambiguity because in English words can have different interpretations. So you know, there's no room for ambiguity in LTL or linear temporal logic. So what's an example? We've seen this pictorially before. Uh, one example is that what is a model? A model is this composition of this NPN heart plus some pacemaker exactly what you had in Simulink, right? So this is a mathematical model of the system. A specification could be that the pacemaker always has to maintain a lower rate in interval. Uh, is there any case where the A sense to A sense period was, will, uh, you know, the atria to atria period is going to be longer than some undesirable number? So you are not going into tachycardia, right? So, so we have all these symptoms. We will express those symptoms as a requirement over the timers using this specification or LTL language. And once we have the mathematical model and the specification, we will feed that into a model checker, and the model checker will return either a guarantee that, yes, the specification will never be violated, which is a very strong output, or if it will return a counterexample, where in this scenario, your specification is not, is, you know, not valid. So the pacemaker is actually not able to do its job. So to begin doing that, we have to understand each of those pieces. We have to understand the mathematical model and this LTL language. So, so far, we 
double dipped our sort of you know progress in this module in the sense that while you were learning about timed automata, I was also teaching you about how the heart works. Right? So they were closely coupled. But we haven't really expressed an automaton as a mathematical object. Right? You have a pictorial view of what's a transition, what's a guard, reset, state, and whatnot. But how do we actually represent an automaton as a mathematical object? Right? That's what we mean by the mathematical model of the system. So in fact, what we are going to do in this module is that we will simplify our lives and just work with regular transition systems. Right? So we will work not with timed automata, but with regular transition systems, where there's no necessarily specific component of time. Only because we want to understand this, this question that, you know, can we, how can we answer this exhaustively? That how am I able to say that this is a guarantee and there is no possible simulation or set of parameters of your model or some transition or loop that exists in your model uh, that is uh, you know, um, uh, producing incorrect behavior or, or, or producing correct behavior. So what this lecture is going to be is going to be a series of short you know, modules themselves where we will mathematically get into the weeds of what a transition system is and what is uh, LTL specification, and how do you use both of those things to understand uh, you know, what is model checking. Okay, so, uh, so ne the next set of lectures are going to be similar to how we had some lectures in um, just math in the first module. So don't be, uh, don't be afraid, I'll walk you through everything. All right, so our model, by the way, is what I'm describing as a transition system. I didn't say that the model is a timed automaton. An automaton is what? It's a transition system with clocks, resets, and actions. So it's actually a more complex mathematical entity than a simple transition system. So, so I first want to describe to you what a transition system is mathematically. But before we do that, there's going to be a few uh, new terms and definitions that you should understand. So let's begin with this new definition or a term um, that we haven't seen so far, it's called an atomic proposition. Okay, so what is an atomic proposition? Let's say I have a transition system, let's say it's the heart, and I am interested in tracking some property of some variable in my system. What I'm calling a variable could be a clock, it could be a message, it could be uh, a reset signal. All of those are sort of variables in my transition system. So I can say at any time, is the ERP timer less than some value, right? This very simple statement, a very basic statement of, about a variable, which you are interested in checking whether that statement is true or false at any given time, that's what is called an atomic proposition. Atomic refers to the simplicity of the statement. And why is it a proposition? Because an atomic proposition is either true or false at any given time in your system. Right, so what example is shown here is sort of decoupled from, from our heart understanding. Uh, and let me tell you a little bit of history because you know, you know, I always try to bring that up or weave that in. Uh, this whole field of model checking and finite state machines and transition systems, a lot of this is influenced by the semiconductor industry. Right, so when people were designing these uh, transistors and how they would connect to build you know, a logical gate or uh, ultimately like a, a chip which can do something very, very specific and special, you know, there were millions of these transistors. They could be in different states of on or off or you know, some, some have even more than a binary state. Um, so then they had to design these possible transitioning of each of these individual components and before you you know, send, send your design for a tape out where they would actually make the chip on silicon, they had to do model checking that nothing goes wrong in my logical operations. That's like the history of this computer science field and why it became very, very powerful. And so oh, at that time, they were very concerned, you know, whether the voltage in my circuit exceeds or decreases a particular threshold at any point or at any place in the circuit. So that's why you know, some of the examples you will find in literature of model checking refer to voltages and things like that because it's trying to uh, get inspiration from uh, actual semiconductor tape outs. But the point is, 
anatomic proposition, which we will denote with this uh, acronym AP, very self-explanatory. Anatomic proposition is the simplest statement or an inequality that you are interested in checking whether that is true or false. Okay, let's just uh, agree that that's the definition without looking at the history and whatnot. So given that is a new term, let me first define what is a transition system. And before I go over a lot of text, let me actually draw a transition system. So let's do this uh, experiment and see how it pans out. All right, so I'm going to define a transition system T as, I'm going to define this as a mathematical object or a tuple or a tuple, based on how you want to say it, which has many, many elements. The first element is the set of states. And I'm going to show you an example. Another element of a transition system is the set of initial states. The next element is the set of actions. Another element is a transition relation delta followed by a set of atomic propositions, and finally, a labeling function L. So there are six elements which make up together a mathematical definition of a transition system. So let me draw one because that's the best way to understand what a transition system is. So let's just draw a simple system with three states. I'm going to call these states S0, S1, and S2. And let me draw some very simple transitions. I'll explain what ABC is in just a second, and we can have a self-loop as well. Okay, so this is a very basic transition system. Don't confuse it with whether this is a timed automata or not. It's a much simpler object. So let's look at what each of these elements are for this transition system. And something was missing. Let me put that as well. So the set S is just the set of different locations in my system, right? So my system has three states or three locations. Sorry, not three, it's two. Right, so this is the set S. Very intuitive what this is. Given this example, the set S is just the set of all states. What is the set I in our example? It's just S0. Notice that when I defined I, I said that it could be the set of initial states. It's a plural, I didn't use the term state, and that was on purpose. You will see examples later where a transition system can have multiple initial states. So it doesn't have to start from a single state always. But let's not worry about that for now. We are just understanding these elements or what this mathematical object is. So the first element is the set of states, the other is the set of initial states. A are the set of actions that can cause transitions between the states. So in this example, when I'm in state S0 and I receive an input A, small a, I will transition to S1. In S1, when I receive an input B, I will transition to S2. I'm calling it input or action interchangeably. You can think of it as an input because you know that's what our understanding of a system is as well. So in this example, we have three possible inputs to our system. We have A, B, and C. That's the set of actions. Sometimes the set of actions is also called the alphabet of our transition system. But let's just keep it as an action for now. So the first three are very easy, right? They, you just look at the picture and you can fill up these. Yes? Sorry, you have two types of these. They are the same, right? They are the same. But they are happening at different, they are enabling different transitions. The B is the same. Um, yeah, any other questions? Yes? Well, you can see that B is enabling a transition from S1 to S2, but another B is also, so it depends on where you were when you received the B. It could be the same B, but based on what your location was, you could do different things, okay? So why is that confusing, right? So because if you are in S, S, S1 and you receive a B, the transition says that you can go to S2. But if you are in S2 and you receive a B, you have to remain in S2. So don't think of, again, B as 
you know, the, a message or a clock reset. There is some equivalency, but for now, this is a very simple picture that these are the transitions that are arbitrarily defined, and based on this picture, what is our action space? Yes. No, they are inputs. This is like a, you can think of it as my system receives the input A and that transition is taken. Okay, so not probabilities, specifically not messages. So it's, uh, I know it doesn't feel natural, but throw the heart model out of your brains for a second. Right? We always look at a much simpler mathematical object where A, B, Cs are the actions which enable transitions. That's the best sort of definition. In fact, our next element of the tuple is explicitly going to, cap going to capture that. So what delta is, delta is called a transition relation. So delta is the set of all possible transitions that can occur in my transition system. So let me give you one element of delta. The first element of delta itself could be S0 A S1. So this says that there is a transition which goes from S0 to S1 when we receive input A. What could be another element? It could be S1, B, S2, correct? Another one could be S2, B, S2, because you remain in S2, sorry. You remain in S2 when you receive this B. And the last transition in this simple system is S2, C, uh, S0. You can go back. So these are the only all possible transitions that can occur in this picture, right? And so this set is called delta, which has this very uh, uh, you know, descriptive name that this is a transition relation set. So good so far, what SIA and delta is? Now let's look at what role does atomic propositions play in a system, right? So this picture doesn't show what an atomic proposition is. So let me actually augment my transition system with some more notations. So I'm going to say P and maybe P comma Q and just Q. So what P and Q are some atomic propositions which are specified by the person who's designing this transition system. And what this notation tells me is that when I visit state S0, P is true. So I'm saying that which atomic propositions are going to hold true in each of the states. I'm providing additional knowledge, which is part of the definition of a transition system. So what is AP? AP is simply the set of the atomic propositions. So in our system, we only have two atomic propositions and its combination. So this is something that you know is provided externally by the by the user, right? So the user is interested in tracking voltage. So P and Q would be some inequality on voltage. For our case, it could be some inequality on some specific timer. Okay. So now we know that this transition system only deals with two propositions, P and Q. Which ones are true where is, is, the, is not the definition of AP. AP is just a set of atomic propositions. So we're almost done, right? We've done five out of six of our mathematical objects. The last one is also very easy, but let me tell you what it is. So L is a labeling function. L is a labeling function which takes an input a state and produces a label. Let me write this in the power set of the atomic proposition. So that's a mouthful, okay. Let me first tell you what L is for the system and then I'll define what a power set is, if you have forgotten that. In this system, I can say that the label for the state S0 is P. So, so the label is telling me which proposition holds true in which state or location. So the label for S1 is P and Q, both are true. And the label for S2 in this system is just Q. Only Q is true out of our atomic propositions when you are in S2. So let me put a, a, a small you know, hyperlink here. If we have a set omega, which has elements, let's say, x1 to xk, do you know what the power set of this set is? Uh, is anyone familiar with this notation? 
Okay, let me tell you what this is, right? So the power set of this, right? So if I'm given omega, what is the power set of omega? The power set of omega is the set of all possible sets I can build using omega. Okay, so let me write that down because then it'll be very clear. So I can definitely include an empty set where none of the elements are part of that. Then I will have sets where only, you know, x1 and we, we will have sets which only have a single element from our original omega. Then we can have sets which are like pairwise elements from our set omega, right? So you can have things like xk and many more. All the way, you'll have all possible sets, and clearly I'm not very good at writing down, but let me give it a shot. You have all possible sets until you will have a set of all possible sets itself, or omega itself. So you will start from the empty set, and you will look at all permutation combinations until the final set is omega itself. And this object is called a power set of any given set. So what is L? L is a mapping from every state to the power set of AP. So what is the power set of AP for this example? It's the empty set, it's the set P, it's the set Q, and it's the set P comma Q. These are the only possible values that are present in the power set. And what L is, it's going to map every state to one of these elements, which is exactly what L is in our system. Are you with me, or have I lost you? It's, it's just definitions. We haven't really explored anything. I'm defining new terms, so let me repeat myself, right? So now we have a definition for all the elements of our object. We start with the set of states, which is very clear, three states. That's my set S. I, I know what I is because I can look at this dangling arrow. I only have a single element or state in my set I. A is the set of actions that's, that this automaton or transition system accepts, or the set of inputs. So my automaton drawn here responds to three inputs A, B, C. So that's why that's the set A, or the alphabet A. Delta is a new thing. Delta is a transition relation set. It's the, it's the set of all possible transitions, where each transition has this form of source, action, and destination in terms of the location. So we have delta defined as these four possible transitions. Next is AP. AP is what atomic propositions are explored for this transition system, right? AP is different from the power set of AP, so don't confuse the two. AP in this case is simply PQ, right? This, this is only, these are the only two atomic propositions we are interested in in this system. And L, this is just a fancy mathematical notation, but L is a label which tells you which propositions are true in which locations. Okay? Questions? So for L as one, yeah. with P and Q. Yeah, comma is and in this case. 